Well, good morning. It's wonderful to be with you again today. Isn't it something? We actually have weather here in Sun City. A little bit of rain. Wow, this is exciting. I saw somebody actually heard some thunder and saw some lightning too. So it's a, it's a beautiful morning, a little cooler, and welcome. I want to remind you that we are going to be sharing in Holy Communion a little bit later. So uh, if you haven't prepared yet to have a little bit of bread and uh, some juice handy, whatever you have is fine. We'll share in that Holy Communion together. Would you pray with me now as we begin this time? Holy and gracious God, we come before you to uh, share uh, the word, to hear what you have for us today. And so I give thanks for the word that you've given to me. Speak through me, Lord, that your voice would be heard, not mine. In Jesus' name, amen. I love how things kind of work together. Uh, I had selected this uh, topic in the uh, verses some time back, and, and then uh, Pastor Linda decided to do the teaching on prayer on Monday morning, so uh, things kind of just come together, so it's very timely in that regard. Grateful for that. You know, while I've uh, prayed regularly most of my life, the past 24 years I've intentionally prayed with and for people as a ministry to them. I believe in prayer and the power of prayer to affect change in people and in the world. Now, over the years, there's been just a handful of people who have declined my prayer to pray for them, but I think that number may be increasing among people who are not connected with church or who are not active Christians. Following Hurricane Florence in 2018, there was a group of researchers who talked with 400 North Carolina residents. And they asked them to describe the suffering and the hardships that they had endured following the hurricane. Um, and then they made an offer of a thought or a prayer and tied that offer to money. What did they discover? Well, they discovered that Christians valued prayer from a stranger putting its worth at more than $4 for a prayer. The non-religious participants, however, said that they would pay up to three fifty, dollars not to have a prayer from a stranger who might be a Christian wanting to pray from them. Now, perhaps what many of them really wanted was action, not a prayer or a thought. Indeed, faith without action, uh, without works, is a dead faith. So for the most part, our prayers need to be accompanied by action. There are times when our human need cannot be met with action. Consider a relative or a close friend who's dying of a terminal illness, a friend going through a divorce, or one feeling deeply discouraged. Yeah, the ministry of presence with them is invaluable. Cards, notes, a meal are all great actions, but none of those will solve or mitigate the problem, but they do convey love, God's love. What is the value of prayer? I hope that most of you would put uh, the value of prayer well over $4, but what really happens when we pray? That's a good question to ask, I think. First, we can definitively say that, there's, uh, that prayer changes us when we pray. There's even been some scientific evidence to that action. One recent study conducted by the New York University Langour Medical Center uh, took members of Alcoholics Anonymous who were placed in an MRI scanner and then shown drinking-related images in order to stimulate some cravings to drink. And it worked. Doesn't that sound a little bit cruel? But the cravings were soon reduced when the participants, well, you guessed it, they prayed. The MRI data showed changes in parts of the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for the control of emotion and the semantic repraisal of emotion, emotion the study cited. Now, the so-called serenity prayer adopted by AA encourages that kind of internal change that the study looked at. God, grant me the serenity to, to accept the things I cannot change 
the courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. By the way, that prayer was first spoken by theologian Reinhold Niebuhr during World War II. Now, does prayer also affect the world around us? Well, little Johnny, bright five-year-old boy, uh, told his daddy he'd really like to have a baby brother, and along with his request, offered to do whatever he could to help. Well, dad, being a very wise man, said, well, I'll tell you what, Johnny, if you pray every day for two months for a baby brother, I guarantee that God is going to give you one. Well, Johnny responded eagerly to his dad's challenge, went to his bedroom and that night to start praying for a baby brother. And he prayed every night for a whole month. But after that time, he began to get a little skeptical. He checked around the neighborhood and found out what he thought was going to happen had never occurred in the history of the neighborhood. You don't just pray for uh, two months and then whammo, a baby brother. So Johnny quit praying. Well, after another month, Johnny's mother went to the hospital, and when she came back home, his parents invited him into their bedroom. Hey, Johnny cautiously walked into the bedroom, not expecting to find anything, that there was a little bundle lying right next to his mother. And his dad pulled back the blanket, and there was not just one, but two baby brothers. His mother had twins. Johnny's dad looked down on him and said, Now, aren't you glad that you prayed? Well, Johnny hesitated just a, a little bit and looked up at his dad and said, Yes, but aren't you glad I stopped when I did? <laughs> there are certainly times when our prayers for change seem to go unheard, perhaps because we are not praying within God's will. I'm willing to bet there were as many people praying for the 49ers to win as there were for the Chiefs during the Super Bowl this year. And then the 49ers fans discovered which team God was rooting for. So who and what is God rooting for? Well, let's take a look at our text today. Psalm 31. This is a psalm of deliverance, and the writer begins with a positive affirmation about his faith. It writes right there in, in, in verse 1, And you, O Lord, I take refuge. This, is a, this writer knows who to trust and knows where to go when times get tough. You see, God hears us when we are uncertain about what to do, but when we know where to go, prayer. It's a step toward praying in God's will. You see, the Bible informs us that God is on your side. Jesus and the Holy Spirit both intercede for you. So when you take refuge, you take a step closer to God. And the closer you are, the more you understand. You grasp a little bit more of God's grace and his will for you and the world. Now, there are times that I just need to uh, reorient myself to my priorities in life, and I just need to, to take that action, beginning with an affirmation of faith and who I am, uh, like we do regularly in worship like we did today. This is a way to come back into alignment with God. You know, there are just far too many distractions in life pulling you away from what's truly important. God is concerned about you today in this life. Now, he wants you engaged with life, living out the gifts he's given to you so that others might know the same grace of God that you and I have experienced. Hmm. When people give themselves to Jesus, the kingdom grows. Taking refuge in God doesn't mean we don't trust medicine or science. They are both gifts of God and inform us and help us and, and, and make our lives richer. Nor does it mean that we're hiding from the world, for we are made to be in the world, revealing Christ to the world. 
Now, we don't know what the psalmist's uh, challenge was as he was writing Psalm 31. Perhaps it was a physical or a mental distress. Maybe it was political. But the first thing he did was orient to God. I think most of us have had in life a fox a foxhole moment. Those are those times when we find ourselves under imminent threat of physical or emotional trauma, and so we cry out to God pleading for help. Now, so often when we are in those moments, we also find ourselves reorienting to God. Maya Angelou, uh, activist and a, and a Christian writer, once said, Love recognizes no barriers. It jumps hurdles, leaps fences, penetrates walls to arrive at its destination of hope. And then Billy Graham once said this, Have you ever said, well, all we can do now is pray? Because God's love has no barriers and will arrive at its destination of full of hope, we can pray those foxhole prayers we can pray at those times when all we can do is pray and know with all assurance that God has inclined his ear to us. You, you are who God is rooting for. Mary was out with some friends one night. They uh, picked up some beer and whiskey and were having a little party. And when they heard the sound of a train approaching near the house and and one of the party goers said, hey, there's a, a signal tower there. Let's go climb that signal tower and watch the train go by. So up they went. And on that, uh, after the train went by, they sat up there drinking and, and kind of partying and talking for a while. And then later on, Mary, woozy with alcohol, started to go down, but she lost her grip and her foothold, and she fell. Mary's family learned that she had some broken bones and lots of cuts and bruises, but the big problem was she had hit her head when she fell, and she was in a coma. It was a foxhole moment for that family. For two days, the doctors did what they could, but the news finally came to them that uh, they could do no more, and there had been no cognitive brain activity. Nothing further could be done. It was decision time. Well, the family pleaded for one more night. And just in case, could they find a chaplain or someone to pray? The family weren't Christian, but maybe. Just maybe. The hospital chaplain was called, and he knew this was important. He called his pastor, who called together a few others who regularly pray and intercess for uh, people who had been ill, and they also called Kevin. Now, Kevin's a teacher from Kenya who was at the university studying for another master's degree, and uh, Kevin was gifted in prayer and very much in tune with the Holy Spirit. They arrived late that night and began praying, and they prayed in earnest for 30 to 45 minutes when Kevin suddenly announced, we can stop now. She's going to be okay. As they left the hospital, Mary's family was, still had little hope, and there was no visible change. It seemed like they were still in the same place they had been. But then when morning came, Mary woke up. And after convalescing from her other injuries, she returned to normal life. Mary Angelou said, I know that when I pray, something wonderful happens, not just to the person I'm praying for, but also something wonderful happens to me. I'm grateful that I'm heard. There were a number of people affected by that night, changed by the prayers over Mary when something wonderful happened, when those foxhole prayers went up to God. When you are living in uncertainty, when life is trying to push you down, when the light is getting dim because you're stuck in the miry pit and so deep you can barely see the light, you can join your voice with the psalmist who said this, You are my God. My times are your hands. 
Deliver me from the hands of my enemies, from those who pursue me. Let your face shine upon your servants. Save me in your unfailing love. Verses 15 and 16 from today. God's peace. What the serenity prayer points to, this peace of serenity, comes when you truly place your trust in God. Ah, the troubles may still be there. The struggle is real and it's hard but it need not consume you. Regular prayer, listening, talking, thanking, pleading, lamenting, crying, and laughing with God in prayer will align you with God's will in a way that nothing else can. And over time, it becomes natural because Christ is at your side. The Holy Spirit is empowering you, and God's will becomes written on your heart. Yeah, I think prayer is worth a little more than $4. Do you struggle with prayer? Are you at a loss for words? Do you only come to prayer when you're in the foxhole? Well, the answer is to just start talking like you're talking to an old friend. You can open up all those dark places and begin to heal. You know, like that credit card commercial that asks the question, what's in your wallet? God's asking the question, what's on your heart? Now, the only formula to prayer that I've ever found that's 100% effective all the time is to just talk to God honestly and with all your heart. God is ready to listen, and he's ready to turn his ear to you if you are ready to talk. And my prayer for you is that God's face always shines upon you. Would you pray with me? Holy and gracious God, I give thanks for prayer, this privilege to uh, actually communicate with you, not only with our words, but with our bodies and song and laughter and uh, the agony of crying. And Lord, that you speak to us deep in our souls. You hear our prayers. Thank you that you listen for us. In Jesus' name, amen.